Hi, and welcome to this chat physics session, five ideas from physics education research to change your classroom. And immediately I'm going to change my mind and rename it and say, here are five powerful and interesting ideas that I've drawn out of physics education research that I think are worthy of thinking about, you know, provocations. It's up to you whether you change the classroom. I'm not in the business telling people what to do, but I think all of these are interesting, worthwhile, and at least should promote some thought in terms of what you do. What you do is up to you, but what I would say is I think you should give some time to thinking about the messages that these suggest for you. Right, here are five things I'd like to say a few things about. Something about mechanics, something about maths, models, ranking tasks, and representational fluency. So, provocative question number one, is there a best way to teach mechanics? And the answer is, yes, there is, at least according to this study. I'll throw a few caveats in. This was a research project based in the US and it was based on using undergraduates. Although a lot of the content that was being taught is very similar to what we'd cover at A-level. How do we assess best? That was done with a tool called the concept inventory, in this case, the force concept inventory uh, that assesses students' understanding. So this study wanted to compare interactive engagement versus traditional. Interactive engagement, promoting conceptual understanding, interactive hands-on talking, feedback, discussions with peers. Traditional, lecture-like, recipe labs, follow the instructions, algorithmic problem exams. Um, I don't want to get too provocative, but of course, some people might recognize some of the approaches that uh, are being suggested in that traditional as aligning with what uh, might be referred to as direct instruction. I would take a little bit of issue with that because I think direct instruction is perhaps being misrepresented. But broadly speaking, the teacher takes control, teacher reads stuff out. So we compare interactive engagement to traditional. You compare them and it turns out that interactive engagement is better. Now, better is a problematic word, as anyone that spent any time looking at any set of data will know. These are sample populations, there'll be a great deal of overlap. But broadly speaking, it seems the interactive engagement approaches, as outlined earlier, yielded better learning gains than the traditional approach. And if that sample size wasn't big enough for you, this work was revisited in 2016 and they looked across a wider range of contexts. So in addition to sort of the comparison between interactive engagement and traditional lecturing, this version of the study also looked at different contexts and different environments to see whether that made a difference. And it turns out, broadly speaking, no. It turns out that interactive engagement appears to be a more efficacious way to teach mechanics, introductory physics, than the lecture style approach. Now, I'm always cautious and saying, oh, you must teach this way. But what I would say comes out of this paper is we do have a large scale study, rigorously done, reviewed in multiple contexts that suggests a particular approach to teaching mechanics is more likely to help students learn than another one. Interactive engagement appears to be a better approach to teaching that particular topic than the more traditional lecture style, do lots of questions and more questions and more questions. So I don't offer that as a you must do it. I offer that as a provocation to reflect. And when you're thinking about planning your topic here, maybe you should be starting thinking about what's uh, in the original study in here referred to as interactive engagement. And following on from that, I'm going to take the line about doing lots of questions a little bit further and talk about the role of maths in physics and suggest that if your view of the mathematical side of physics is to get students to do question after question after question. I'm going to suggest there's a potential problem there. And I'm going to draw my argument from two places. The first is from a lecture from Lillian McDermott in 2001. Lillian was one of the kind of giant brains in physics education research. She's quite blunt in her view. Being able to do standard quantity problems is not adequate. It doesn't mean it's not needed. Of course it's needed but it's not enough. You've got to get students to think about their thinking, their reasoning and their answers, both to help them as learners 
and in a good way for us as teachers. Give them questions they can't memorize. And as a whole slew related to the um, first research paper I mentioned, but also more broadly in physics that says that students can do a bunch of numerical questions, you give them a conceptual question, they get it wrong. So this is not just someone's opinion, this is based on evidence. The second person I want to draw into this argument to support what I'm going to say is a person called Paul Hewitt. Now's not the time to talk about how great he is, but he makes a really significant distinction, at least in my mind, between mathematical and computational. The mass is there, the mass is important, we can't ignore it, that's part of what makes physics beautiful. But physics should not be solely computational, and certainly if you start with the computational, the plug the numbers in, then maybe you're not doing it in the right order. And I would then add also, if our students' experience of physics is question after question after question after question after question, isn't that an impoverished experience of physics? The questions, the numerical questions have got to be there, but if you lead with those questions, and that's what students see as the identity, that just seems a terrible representation of a beautiful subject that's so much more than that. And Paul Hewitt developed a whole load of questions that are conceptual, that are the kind of thing Lily McDermott was talking about, that do require students to think. They're available for free, from the Arbor Scientific website, and they are fantastic. Possibly the second most useful website for any physics teacher after FET. Models. I think we're all reasonably confident that the use of models is a very key part of a physics teacher's life. If you're teaching electricity, you could probably, you know, fill a room full of different models and everyone has their own view. And I'm not gonna talk about which is the best model for the moment, I'm going to talk about some ideas that I've borrowed and tweaked slightly from this paper. All three well-respected writers in physics education, Eugenia Aquina, I would make another particular kind of flag wave for as being a really great brain and mind in physics education. So if you see her name, definitely read anything she's done because it's, it's worth your time. But in this paper, one of the suggestions they make is that you can consider a kind of taxonomy of models. And this is, this is a sub subset of what they offer, but I think this is the school version. Models could be descriptive. They could be explanatory. They could be predictive. Some models might be one or more of those. Some models um, may have aspects of some of them. So if you take the rope model, for example, I think it's descriptive about the relationship between the pull and the current and the moving of the rope. I don't think it's explanatory. It doesn't really explain why the electrons are moving and it's kind of quasi predictive. But the thing I would take from the paper and the thing I would suggest if I you know, push this taxonomy on you is it's a really good simple language to think about yourself and when talking to students, it's a way of framing, considering, evaluating and talking about the models you used. So you go beyond this is a model that you know you, you think about modeling as a process itself, which is a powerful and important part of being a physics teacher. So when you come back to deciding your models in electricity or elsewhere, I'm going to suggest that three part descriptive, explanatory, predictive. Use that as a way to interrogate your choices and as a way to talk to students about what you think might be a good or bad idea and why. I want to talk about ranking tasks very briefly. Ranking tasks are multiple choice questions where students have to take all the answers and order them from highest to lowest or some other kind of comparative measure. What's good about them is they require students to engage with all of the answers. So in a way, all the answers are right, it's just how right they are. So rather than immediately picking a right answer, discarding the others, this type of question requires students to really think about what is going on. This particular one is written by a colleague of mine called Richard Brock. There are ones available and I'll show you a few in a second, but I think they're really powerful questions because they really force students to think. In this particular case, there's a certainty level as well. And just to throw in a kind of teaser to other things that we may get to talk about another day, looking at how confident students are and the accuracy of their response can yield some interesting answers, particularly with respect to individual groups. Gender is one, but there are other ones. So that question I showed you is written by Richard. They do take a while to write. So if only you could buy a book of them, well, you can. So there we go. 
So Tippers has loads of ranking tasks and loads of other questions as well. It's a bit frustrating, it doesn't have any answers, but um, that's one that's in print now, whereas the ranking task exercises in physics book, you have to get secondhand, but highly recommended and an enormously powerful and useful resource of, of ranking task, which I would suggest is a really, you know, well thought through type of question in physics. Final thing I want to talk about is what I'm going to call representational fluency, and it's an aspect of expertise in physics, or I guess in, in learning physics and teaching physics. Comes or is adapted, my thinking is adapted from this particular paper from the very 90s, another well regarded name in physics education, um, who tried to kind of cope with or categorize what it was that made people think like physicists in terms of answering questions. But I'm going to draw one thread out. This step paper is definitely worth getting a holding of and looking at, but it is particularly focused on undergraduate teaching, so it gets quite heavy in places. Let's have a question. There we go. Looks reasonably familiar. That might also, having been presented in words in that first example, presented in some kind of pictorial diagrammatic version there. But most of you will go, oh, yeah, okay, I can see it's the same question. Might represent it as a graph. Or it might be represented in a format like that. If you are an expert in physics, you see one question that's represented in four different ways. You can navigate between them, but the, the deep question, the question that sits beneath all of those is the same to your mind. And the suggestion is from the Van Hooveland paper and certainly from other work about expertise uh, beyond physics, is novices see surface features, experts see deep features underneath it. So in this question, someone who is not fluent in physics may well be seeing four different questions. They may not realize that it's the same question. Even if those multiple representations are put on the same board at the same time, they may not realize, oh, it's all the same thing. That graph is of the peregrine falcon. Those arrows are representing that. Those U, V, T's and A's are the same question. So one of the characteristics of expertise in physics is the ability to navigate between multiple representations in physics. And so us as experts need to think about how we support students in doing that, in realizing that these are multiple versions of the same question and the same question can be represented in different ways. So that idea of representational fluency sounds a bit fancy, but actually it's a really important articulation of what it means to be an expert in physics that we need to be aware of in ourselves as teachers. And we need to think about how we develop that in students. So there we go. Teaching mechanics, maths, models, ranking tasks, representational fluency, a few things that I thought I would share with you. Brilliant, that's it, five things. Hopefully I've stimulated you to think about what's going on. In a minute when this video disappears, my email will go up and you can have my contact address and I'll be delighted to enter into an email discussion with you should you wish to about any of those things or indeed anything else to do with physics teaching. Cheerio.